Over here we're starting off with the Cedar locations in Prince William Sound, the northernmost reach of the Yellow Cedar. Right, and, and it, was, it was harvested for uh, cedar bark, cedar bark mats, blankets, mm -hmm. capes. It was woven in with the goat hair, yes? Yeah. yeah. And so that it was over here at uh, Wells Bay, a place called Cedar Bay in there. And there are Carl Children Alter trees in there on Glacier Island. It's the same. And, and what do these culturally altered trees look like? It's a, an evident gash to everybody, or you would have to know what to look for? You'd have to know what you're looking for because it looks like the tree has grown hmm. with a debit in uh -huh. it. And I'm not sure if they they pulled it on the shady side or the sunny side of the tree. They cut across a notch and then up the sides and then pull it from the bottom up. As long as uh, as high as 20 feet, they could get a stick in there and keep pulling it off until it came down. Oh, I had no idea they could get strips that long. That's impressive. Yeah. Well, if there's no limbs, because they'd probably pick an area where they wouldn't any limbs sticking out. But anyway, you can still, there's still evidence in, on those trees, so they got to be two, three hundred years old where they've been stripped. Right. Apart and stripped. They don't kill the tree, they just treat, they take one strip out of the tree. That's amazing to me because I know you have to be really careful with birch that you don't girdle the tree right. as you kill it. Right. And it was a good wood to use for making uh, uh, utensils and bowls and stuff like that. It carves easily? Cedarwood, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, nice smell, too. Yeah. But it's over in uh, Ravina, Point, Sheep Point, uh, Cedar Bay on Hawkins Island. Right. And, and Sheep Point, as you, I'm sorry, as you pointed out, was there are no sheep, but there might have been, there were domestic sheep raised there. Right. And then on Hawkins Island, we have the more cedar. Yeah, and then uh, anything you find in Cordova has been transplanted there. It never grew there naturally. There was a lot oh, really? of who, who made the effort to transplant it? Different people would move the, take the small cedar trees into town. I know there's one at Richard Davis or a couple at Richard Davis' house. There's some in front of the Forest Service compound. Oh, okay. There's a few around. Yeah. Carl Burton has some on his trip. Mm -hmm. Village sites, I haven't got them all marked in here, but just starting in, uh, in Orca Inlet. Um, we've got fish camps at the head of all these bays. Everybody in to Titlick and Eak would move into fish camps. And so all the heads of the bays where the salmon streams are, were, there was usually a family uh, that would move there for the summertime to dry, smoke and dry fish. Right, Leona was explaining to me, I was asking if all the people from Tatitlik went to the same area, and she said, no, 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 each family right. chose an area. They had their own, their own bays and their own salmon streams and nobody infringed on their territory. And it was just common knowledge or was there also some sort of mark? No, place? it was just common knowledge. Yeah. And, uh, sometimes it was quite a trek to get to these different fish camps. You know, I mean, uh, the darkies or the yaks, you know, it was, it was a, a couple days travel to some of them. And we've got a lot of ancient Villages. So these fish camps would be named, would have a family name yeah. attached to it? Yeah. yeah. And Tintinlik was real famous in you know, more modern times of, with nicknames for people. And, you know, people from Tintinlik and EAC use all this area on the side of Prince William Sound, all the salmon streams. You know, they harvest it berries in all different places, not necessarily real close to the beach. People would go all the way out to Strawberry Point to get strawberries. Well, there's places called Olson Bay, yeah. Indian Creek, you know, where there was a big fish camp there. And there's another place down here called uh, Whiskey Pete. That was Pete Olson. And uh, he always commercial fished off of one point there. And that's what they call it. I don't know. I don't know. It's on there. Well, it's on there. Oh, we have the Whiskey Creek in town, certainly, too. Yeah. 
But there was a lot of bootlegging going on too. Yeah, Whiskey with, Creek goes um, off of um, goes into Apples Lagoon. Well, I got Fish Camp <laughs> Villages. Let's go with the villages. You know, here we got Makarka Point. That was, uh, you know, when the people moved from Nuchuk, they went up to. Uh, Macarca Point, and then eventually moved into to Titlick and Cordova. And they're moving out of Nuchuk because of the. Uh, I'm not sure what it was. Uh, was it smallpox? Yeah. Some disease. Mm -hmm. you know. So an epidemic of some epidemic. sort. Epidemic. There you go. Then they moved to uh, Macarca Creek, and then they ended up moving into Cordova after that but uh, and most of the the people moved to where the work was you know I mean the, the people from Alganic and like Cape Martin Catella moved to Cordova when the railroad came in here so they they moved out of these outer villages in, into Cordova and uh, the, in Cordova itself they had Eak, a community of Eak, it had its own zip code. It's called Old Town, and, uh, and then they had Cordova. Then Hazlet came in and surveyed and divided up uh, and developed. Uh, but you also had Shepherd Point. Is Shepherd a name or an occupation? It's a name, I guess. It had something to do with Sheep Point, Sheep Bay, I think, Shepherd Point. Because the Tiedemans lived on, uh, right across from there on uh, North Island. And they came from Alice Cole, Sheep mm -hmm. Bay. For fox farming? Fox farming, and maybe they were raising sheep, too. I don't think you should have the sheep and the fox on the same island. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, the, the sad part about it is that people could, that could really tell us what they were doing has passed, has passed on. I know. Um, so it's like the people moved to where the work was, like to Titling. When they started up in Dayville, up in Valdez, they all moved up there to work in the summertime in the cannery up there. Right, and I see there's no Dayville on this map. No, but it was across the bay from where Valdez is located now. It was on the south. Leona said that she spent a week or two with an aunt and uncle growing up in Tatitlik and Fish Camp, but that once life got better, she didn't go anymore. And I said, what do you mean life got better? I said, more income. Right. Right. So she would have been going, I assume, in the 30s? And uh -huh. Maybe into the 40s? And well, May Lang, she always talked about growing up in Catella. And they put up a lot of fish there. They had big smokehouses. Every family had a smokehouse. And she was in her 90s when she told me. She says, you know what they called me when I was growing up? No, no idea. They called me Smokehouse May. <laughs> <laughs> because she spent all her time in there? or No, she loved smoked fish. She was going to store the fish in the attic and hang it up where it was dry and she'd be sneaking up in the attic to get it. Smokehouse May. Yeah. It's like, she's smoking. <laughs> but, uh, so there's a lot of history down there. The uh, eastern part, in the north. Right. So Catella would have fallen apart by the. It didn't last long. Uh, yeah. The twenties, thirties. Well, I think uh, maybe it lasted till the thirties. Uh, there's people there later than that, because I can remember uh, shortly before the Vietnam War ended, there was people that still lived down there. Oh, I think okay. Jimmy. Jimmy Weber was born down there. Yeah, I mean, there's some fabulous pictures of little Jimmy and uh, brother when, and when uh, Ann Hodnett, Ed Hodnett, and Tommy uh, Cloudman moved into Cordova from Catella. 
probably 1965. So it was probably pretty much abandoned by 1970, I would say. Mm -hmm. Just some guides use the area and survey companies and stuff like that. They still had that hope for development of oil. Yeah. Plus the carbon mountain, coal. There was still, that was still privately owned before the uh, land claims. Right. And it's interesting when you fly over to see the little railroad track spurs from Catella. Right. Yeah. Villages, though, between Catella and Alganic? Yeah, there's uh, Cape Martin. Cape Martin. And it's more of an ancient village site, but that's kind of the an area where the Plink Edge people that came up the coast. Yes. My understanding is that the Clinkets were slowly creeping up from the southeast. Right. And at one point, Yakutat switched from being predominantly EX speaking to Clinket speaking. Uh -huh. And there was EX people that went that direction too. No, Danny, he went to Cape Martin. And is Martin named after the animal or a person? Animal. There's lots of Martin over there. And then there was uh, Chilcat Village over here in Bering River, which was a native village. But most of those people moved from the village to Catella when it started getting populated. And the Chilcat, people in Chilcat would have been Eak? I'd say it's a combination of Eak and Clinket. But if you talk to the people in Yakutat now, they have more information on, on the, uh, this area, Barren River, Mishawak, Akali, and uh, Cape Suckling. You know, those are all Clinket words, I think. They could be Eak words. So, I mean, I've talked to a lot of uh, people in Yakutat that were born on the Calliot River, Sayu River area, mm -hmm. and they uh, ended up down in Yakutat itself. But these are elders, or you know, they're seventeen years old. Now, now since they were there, it was one of the largest log areas on the Gulf Coast of Alaska. It started at Ice, Ice Bay, Bay yeah. and came north, and they could see it from the below when they looked down on the earth. Well, obviously, Egg Islands is a... That would be a translation, I guess. Native name, yeah. And uh, copper, sands, you know, the Copper River comes down and pushes these sands out here, yeah. Copper River sands. Um, then you have Peter Dahl. And who was Peter Dahl? I'm not really sure, but... Uh, he was some old timer, but I'm not sure if he was a fisherman or. He had a cabin somewhere around, or. I read something about it one time. Dick Shellhorn would know. Okay, and uh, I mean, there's Tiedemann Slough down there, and the Tiedemanns that, were. That was after the Tiedemann family from Cordova, and that was. I'm just guessing that was an area that they, when you used to be able to fish all the way to the grass banks, that they homesteaded. You know, as far as fishing goes. And of course, they're famous for their boat designs. Right. The Tiedemann skiffs and. Yeah. But that's where at the mouth of the Alganic River. And uh, a lot of the local business people used to go down that had duck cabins in that area would go down and subsistence fish. King Sand. And, and what, what does Alganic mean? I'm realizing that is the name. Well, Alganic Village is up the river and I've, I've been told that, it, that there's a couple different meanings one of the things is it's where the river turns away from the hillside okay so with the and then I yeah, also yeah. heard that it was a uh, cold kind of like fluvic it was it was uh, stay away from here you don't want to come over right, here similar to that but it was ideal for uh, for harvesting salmon because the salmon were right in front of the village going into the Copper River. 
Yes, we have a little bottleneck there right. for them to and get through. So they're, they're, they would dip that salmon right in that area. And they also had a hooligan run that came in the spring, and there's still evidence of uh, pits where they rendered uh, hooligan reefs. There. Really? Along the slough there? Along the Algonac River there. Yeah, there's evidence that the, they would take hot rocks and put in with the hooligan, or else they'd put them in their dugout canoes, and they'd put hot rocks in with the, let the hooligan ferment, and then put hot rocks and water into the, into the dugout canoes, plus it would preserve the... Well, that's fascinating just because that would only work with dugout canoes. You could not do that with a kayak. Right. And so they used to render the oil out and plus dry the, dry the fish there. And, uh, uh, oh, birds, migratory birds. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal in the springtime there. So you had hooligan birds. Coconhenic, um, I've got marked down as a fish camp at the mouth of the Copper River. Talking to the elders, there was a, a fish, actually a fish uh, processor there. And a lot of the early native people would fish there and sell their fish. Like at the beginning of the 20th century? Yeah. And, uh, but the interpretation for Coconhenic is sticker back. So, and Softuck is another another area on the uh, eastern end of the Copper River Delta where the fish are coming in through that area going up the Copper River where there's a lot of commercial fishing. But anyway, it, it needs the area above the cockles. So when you say above the cockles, that means the onshore site is directly above the part of the beach which had the cockles? That's what we mean by above the cockles? I would think so. I would yeah. think so. Yeah. And so soft tuck and organic would be Yak words, presumably. Yeah. Yeah. And then they have strawberry reef, which is by soft tongue. And there's lots of strawberries on there. And that's the other thing, too, is the Tlingit people uh, dried strawberries and used them for trade. And they would take strawberries from the coast of Alaska and go all the way down to the, down the coast into British Columbia. And, uh, trade with it was a trade item. Oh I hadn't heard of those. That's fascinating. And because they would preserve such a strong yeah, sweet flavor. Right. Along with you know they trade sea otter skins and you know as they're going down the coast. So are you aware of any like navigational landmarks, uh, mountains or something that people would cite as they're going along? Or mountain names I guess I'm asking. Yeah well you get down by uh, Icy Bay, and you've got uh, Mount St. Elias, it's 20,000. It's handy, yeah. Yeah, and there's several names for that. I don't know what they are, native names. And then you have uh, this kayak island that juts out into the Gulf of Alaska. You know, that's a pretty prominent landmark. And what I've heard is in the summertime, they used to have a village out on Middleton Island that's 70 miles offshore. But in order to get there from Newcheck, um, in the fall it blows from the southeast, blows this direction. So they would they would go with a, a good weather, sunny days, afternoon wind would be from the west. They would go this way and then they'd catch the change of the weather on a storm to go from here back to Middleton Island, which is, you know, a long journey. To it is. And sometimes they do the same thing down this way. They come off of um, Cape Clear and catch the good weather in the summertime to go to, to Middleton. It's really interesting because Mike Weber talks about this is his great grandmother, grandmother who was a weather person and one of the you know, before you could be designated a weather person, you had to be able to navigate, get people successfully to Middleton Island. Right. It's like a needle in a haystack out there. But it has its own weather. You know, if you really know what you're looking for, it creates a cloud mm -hmm. out there. So sort of that's sort of a visual 
right. that you can go for. And it's really neat when you're out there looking back, looking towards New Shepherd, towards the entrance, towards the Copper River Delta. You know, I mean, the mountains, you can see the tops of the mountains. You can judge where the entrance is and stuff like that. So I've wondered about who Elamar was. I don't know any of the history other than that it was a, that there was a mine there and they got, well up here we got Galena Bay so that means lead. Lead, right. Uh, Elamar was a, I heard it was a gold mine and copper mine. It was. Uh, and then you got Copper Mountain on the other side of Tetlick that has some shafts up in it. That they, so that was a rich mineralized area. And even if it wasn't really high grade, Alaska Steam, when they were bringing the copper down the Copper River, they needed low grade ore. To they would have accepted it as ballast. And, right, yeah. with the high grade. And so they were going around Prince William Sound where this small, low-grade mines were picking up more to take to Tacoma or wherever they did it in Seattle. Mm -hmm. But they did bring copper, you know, down. We got the Copper River and the Chitna River. Chitna means copper. Oh, does it? Yeah. In yeah. Athabasca? Athabasca. So the Chitna went up to the Nazina where the Chief Dan Nikolai's had the rights to all the copper in there, and he was in Gold County. And so they would, they would sled that copper out of there, the, the uh, native copper, it's 100, almost 100% 100 pure. And then they could, I don't know if they put it in fire to anneal it so that you could pound it to shape it. Mm -hmm. Somebody told me that they they made uh, bullets out of it. And they had a, a barrel that the caliber that everybody would shoot up there, and they'd find nuggets for them were the right size, and they'd just drive them through the barrel, you know, so that to sort of smooth them and they could shoot them. Shoot them. I mean, so that it would be the right it diameter. Was the right diameter. Yeah. But there's a lot of uh, Athabasca stories about the copper and how it was discovered and what it was used for. But they used to trade the copper off the Chitna River. They would come down, they wouldn't float down. They would wait till spring and they'd go over the top of the mountains. And then they'd go down the glacier, you know, come over the mountains on the glacier, come all the way to the coast down at, uh, they'd come out of the Ductaw River at Cape Ekataga, and then Ductaw is a Athabascan word, it's on the coast of Alaska in a clink of the area, so it's, that's how they put that story together. And, uh, Jim Carey from the University of Alaska came down looking for place names and Athabascan names on the coast, and he did find some. That was one of them. I know Cape Akatago was, uh, was could be another uh, Athabasca word that had something to do with Safe Harbor because the surf comes comes in on the beach and there's a break in the rocks on that point where they could get one of those big canoes in without crashing. On the beach. So that's where they used to meet the people from the Athabascan people that came down to trade the copper would come down here. And there was another village right here on the Copper River above the uh, Miles Lake. And it was the uh, Eak family that lived there. And their job was to guide the people that were going up the Copper River. They would, for hire, pull dugouts and canoes up to the Copper River places to come back down there. Yeah. Same in Algonic Village, they would get people to, to help them through that area. Uh, Lieutenant Allen, when he came through there, and, and, uh, he used guys from from Algonic, yeah. The idea of going up the copper is just scary. Yeah. 
but there were other routes other than the river. You know, they the, at the basket people, you know, had routes through here where they came out and you know, be going up glaciers and over mountain passes and they came all the way down here to the head of uh, Nelson Bay and the Corobia. And so there's evidence they found some grass baskets up here. One of these glaciers in the Forest Service found them. So there's evidence of people traveling through there. Do you um, know who the Nelson is of Nelson Bay? No. Yeah. But I also got the impression that they traveled over to Valdez. Yeah. There, yeah. There was, there was old, well, at the Baskins are called trail people. You know, so they, they had trails. And, uh, all over the country, you know, they had ways to get to the coast, ways to get over to Anchorage, you know. I like the to be a trail people, you know. Yeah, yeah. Much greater sense of that there's a world to ex land to explore versus the coastal people. We are a salmon people, we are right. And they're pretty famous for not getting lost. I mean they do, they're they can tell they're we had an interior compass that they could follow, you know, navigate. You know, in a lot of the areas where they're traveling, it's like you're saying, they were using mountains as references, and they had names for all those landmarks. Right, my understanding was that they had names for things that were useful for navigating, and it was pointless to name anything else. I also heard that up around Cook Inlet, there's the, among the Denino, their sense of navigation was it wasn't a north, south, east, west. It was more a, does this lead towards the sea or away from the sea? Well, in a world where the sun is moving through the seasons, I think that makes as much sense. There's songs down the, down the coast about paddling under the ice, yes. so where the rivers went under the glaciers. Uh -huh. you know. And I've heard reference to that on the Copper River before, you know, that they, uh, they, uh, there was land bridges across the Copper River with, you know, glaciers, mm -hmm. and they had to go under the ice to come to the coast. They really must have wanted to move. <laughs> yeah. Well, they probably turned and tried to go up current. And we're stuck. We're going to have to go. So, but it's, you know, on the, on the coast, you know, this is all predominantly hemlock and uh, Sitka spruce. And as you go into the interior, you get up about this far, and it's all uh, white spruce. And then you get up in, into here, you even got birch down this far, and uh, aspen. Then you get up into this part, and it's all black spruce, stunted spruce. Yeah, those drunken trees. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, this, they've got a lot of uh, burrows, you know, on those spruce trees, you know, they're this big around, they got big old burrows. A lot of that stuff comes all the way down the Hopper River and deposits down in here. Uh, those burrows useful for anything? They used to make clubs out of them. You know, they're pretty solid. I don't know what else they would have used them for. Well, thank you, Mark. That's yeah. terrific.